Hi everybody, thanks for joining us. We're joined by Juan, Gonza Juan Gonzalez Mendia of uh, Sud America Coaching. And oh, there we are again. Um, technical issues as usual. Um, Chris P here, our core value of the month is empathy. Uh, Juan, thanks for joining us. You've been on before several times. Tell us a little bit about you and your journey. And then also a little bit about the space you've been working in recently. Hi, Chris. Thank you so much for having me back. I can't believe you haven't realized yet, but you're still, you're still inviting me back. But anyway, yeah. um, here I am sitting in my office in, in England, uh, Stanford, uh, where I've been for the last um, three years now. Um, worked around a couple of uh, professional rugby environments before. Um, a club here in the Midlands, a place in the Premiership, and then um, before that, uh, a club from the North East that also plays, used to play in the Premiership, now it's in the Championship. And I'm uh, nowadays involved with another club uh, that plays in the Premiership as well. And I'm uh, trying to get them to understand the importance of going global. So I'm the, the what's the official title? Uh, overseas partnerships uh, management or something like that. It's got a fancy title that I never remember. Um, before that, worked um, in independent schools, so uh, private schools basically. Um, again, around around sporting schools, so well renowned for their sporting disciplines. Uh, again, I run rugby union mostly. Um, and I've got a BA in sports science, I've done my master's in education. Um, and I'm currently going through a, a PhD as well, so which is in the, it's very very early days. Uh, I had a bit of a setback uh, injuring my Achilles uh, last summer, uh, and that put most things on standby, and that was one of them. So, so yeah, here we are um, with yeah. the mighty Chris P. Yeah, <laughs> thanks, one. Um, tell us a little your PhD. What's your PhD going to be? Uh, it's around um, a professional uh, PhD, so slightly different to, to a research one. There is some research involved with it. Um, however, I'm trying to develop a guide, a pocket guide for coaches around relationships. Um, it's going to have uh, some chapters around relationships with your athletes, relationships with your co-coaches, with uh, people that take decisions in, in the organisations. Um, with officials visiting the club, which I think is a, is a crucial one. Um, and yeah, regardless of their relationship or if they still are in this world or not, every athlete has parents. So I think the coach should have a, a relationship with, with parents as well. So um, it's a very practical, uh, hopefully it'll be a very practical resource where people can actually have it in their pockets and they can reach out if they're about to have a a difficult conversation with a parent or if they want to make the visiting staff and, and players uh, go through the best possible experience in their club in terms of visiting elsewhere um, and yeah, hopefully hopefully it'll be giving people practical advice around, around those relationships the research around it is going to be related to the impact that that guy is going to have um, so the idea is to try to, try to spread it out to as many coaches and um, different uh, environments as possible from what we normally call performance or, or elite uh, within sports to all, all the way to grassroots and everything everything in the middle brilliant brilliant i love that um so obviously you, you're working you're looking at get, gaining your phd and working in that space uh, and i know you just got back from croatia right doing a, a little yeah. bit of a coach development coach ed what uh you know what what were some of the things that you were working on um in croatia if you want to share some of the stuff that you worked with with their coaches and yeah so it was a, a fantastic weekend um i was just I, uh, actually writing a bit of a blog about it on the website so uh, going through some photos and some videos and um yeah just just trying to to spread the the word about the sports really um the city of Zagreb, uh, who who was the, the main sponsor, let's call it behind it, um, got in touch through through the work through a couple of people in a rugby club that I know, uh, got us out there, um, got us this really nice room, really nice food on the Friday, 
uh, we spent a day just exchanging with with coaches um, interestingly enough that is the same building where the, uh, the, the Olympic Committee has their offices uh, in terms of Sudbrook and then they got other places in the, in the country as well and um, through the day we had different coaches from other sports popping in as well um, so the sort of theme of the weekend was um, how to create the best experience in terms of the environment that, that the, all the people were going to be exposed, not just the children or the players, but the coaches and the coach developers and the parents and the volunteers and uh, anyone that, but that would come to that environment throughout that week and how can we make them feel the best they can possibly feel. Um, so we discussed uh, a number of things around, around how we could create that. We talked a little bit about how a human being learns and, and we sort of discuss the learning process and the feedback process processes. Um, we also we also had a look at uh, how the weekend was going was going to look and, and we did some planning around that. Um, the plan came from the coaches that were going to be doing the coaching and uh, there were about 70, 80 kids there so it was going to be unrealistic that I was going to be able to coach them all at the same time so um, and the idea for the coaches to try to develop is obviously to develop as their coach and uh, not as they're sitting on, on a room listening to somebody tell them tell them what to do uh, so a very different approach to yeah i would say the majority of the experiences they've had had in the past and um, so a big challenge for me as well to try to, to try to uh, sort of turn down some barriers and and yeah, get people to, to open up, which I think they were very open, to be honest, and they were keen. Um, and again, uh, never been there before, so just 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 nice to to get to meet them. We were working with them since September, um, so that was the first live intervention we've we've done. Um, and yeah, I think I think the feedback has been very good. Obviously, lots of things that we're going to try to improve for next time. Um, and we got two more interventions this year, and then hopefully going back in 2021. Um, that is if the world doesn't come to an end very soon but anyway <laughs> yeah we said we weren't going to mention that but let's let's keep All going right. um so if we're talking about the learning environments and yeah. how to get the best experience for everybody involved coach developer coach player participant parents what were what in all your travels in all of your experiences what has been that common thread Right. I know relationships would be one, obviously. What mm -hmm. have been some of the common threads that you found, regardless of sport, regardless of country, in, yeah. in your thoughts, what have been the common threads for these uh, environments and shaping that experience? Obviously, the majority of, of coaches coaching uh, have been players before and, and have practiced mm -hmm. that sport before, regardless of what sport it is. That tends to be what what's sort of the norm um i think they've been they've been coaching in in a way that uh, they know or they are very suspicious that it wouldn't work with children nowadays so so i think that's the biggest part um now i hear a lot or oh, children don't don't hear or children are not having success or children have gone flat or millennials and all these terms well, there's lots of children having lots of success in, in lots of things. Uh, and those are the things they have lots of participation and, and they try to um, design the environment around their needs. Um, and they have lots of uh, input in terms of how that environment looks as well. So if you look at, um, let's call them successful uh, learning environments in terms of education, um, if you look at uh, places like Finland nowadays, um interactive classrooms people coming in and out uh, there's no bells in terms of when they stop learning and when they go back to learning um, there's play time in terms of when they need to go and, ha and have a play uh, there's everything around project learning there's everything about collaboration participation and um, uh, everything to do with, with beginning to understand who you are and, and what you, why you do the things you do in terms of self-awareness and then passing it on to other people. Um, so again, those places are having loads of success. And, and, and I think going back to the original question, 
that would be the first big thing I come across in terms of uh, we've done things this way for a number of years. Well, why are we going to change it if we've been having success? Well, A, what do we call success? B, how do you know you're having it? And at the end of the day, you just told me children are very different. So, well, why, why are we going to continue to do what we always done? Um, and again, it's uh, I think it's a lack of information at times. I think it's a, a lack of uh, awareness of of what kids are into it and, and what what they want to do. Um, and yeah, and, and there is a bit a little bit of stubbornness in, in there as well. I would have thought. So yeah, that's that that's probably the biggest the biggest thing. I and mean, that's that's a common that's a common thing I see around. Yeah, so, you know, just to unpick a few of those things, right? You said a lot of coaches tend to be former players, so they have a knowledge of the sport. They, mm-hmm. they've, they've coached, they've been coached in a particular way, so they want to coach in a particular way, and they don't want to get into, well, you know, it's proven, the science and the research shows if we, if we do X, then the benefits are Y and Z. You know, yeah. we want to stick with... No, we wanna we wanna go with ABC because we've always done it that way. So, for example, um, let's take an under six, so a six year old. How old is Kata now? She's four. My daughter is three now. Yeah. Three. Yeah. So let, let let's just take let's take an under six for example, and uh, grassroots coach, and they believe that this is a very the the process is linear, and kids by dribbling through cones can improve their dribbling on a short-term basis. For example, take any sport you want, whether it's field hockey, football, or um, basketball, dribbling through cones and kids waiting in lines. This is an environment that is gonna improve their dribbling quicker. How do we dispel those myths and give children a choice, right? Because you you, you use the word choice and have the, um, you know, what is successful learning and interactive environments look like let's 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 talk about that and unpick that and how we move people from here to here well it, it, it depends because if they are preparing for the world championship of dribbling cones i think that that is what should they should be doing really uh, and that's Context. a quote from, from the grand uh, ed cole and there uh, and the corkman uh, yeah anyway dr ed, dr. ed yeah that is the vision a lot of people have about coaching and and, and, and we know that and the people that are probably watching this know that as well um, and yeah I mean we've got to start talking about how people learn we've got to explore that we've got we've got to be able to to tell people why why we're doing what we're doing um, and if the answer is well we've always done it this way well there, there must be there's going to be some more evidence there. We're going to be able to have different conversations. Um, a lot of people will will get the volunteer sort of shield um, from the latest Braveheart version out and go, oh, we are volunteers. Um, well, yeah, you're, you're a volunteer, but you've got a young mind in front of you. And, and I think you, you might need some support around this and this. So so that, that that's a conversation I come across a lot. Um, now, when we discuss learning, uh, I mean, I will encourage people to, to follow uh, great minds uh, around learning, such as uh, Richard Cheatham, uh, MBE. Um, I call him Dr. Learning. Um, another Dr. Learning uh, could be Ed Colan uh, as well. So they, they understand learning uh, and they understand uh, how the human being will, will transfer knowledge to learning um, very well. Um, I mean, the big thing for me a few years ago when, when I started talking about transfer, so how do we transfer from practice to the game? So how do we know kids are actually learning? Um, and it's still a question I, I sort of wrestle with uh, in daily basis. Um, how do we know we're going to transfer this? Um, I think there's lots of tools that we could be using to try to emphasise transition or transfer of learning uh, one of them is the one you just mentioned which is choice and um, i think i think mm-hmm. giving the choice to play with different balls or giving the choice of uh, some rules or, or some areas or, or or opening the transfer market halfway through a game and if you want to buy any players i mean i think there's loads of coaching tools out there 
that could resemble choice and could generate behaviors around our learning. Um, and then, I mean, if we were in a room with a hundred people right now, if all of them were coaches and we would ask the question of who thinks decision making is important, every single person in that room will raise their hand. Uh, now, if they think decision making is important, but their practices don't have decision making or have a very small amount of decisions being made, uh, because there are some decisions being made around when you're running around coats. Um, when do you start? When you don't start? What part of your food you're using? Um, uh, I'm, I'm struggling to find some more. Uh, where are you going to keep your eyes? Let's yeah. say you're going to look up. You're going to look at the ball. Um, what are you going to do in the queue when you're waiting? How many people are going to are you going to push? How many uh, ears you're going to pick and whatever? Um, so those sorts of things are decisions. But I think in a game context, in a, in a play context, in a call it a fixture and match, there will be loads more. So there, I mean, that makes me think. I mean, if, if our training session doesn't look like the game, then then if the, if the amount of choices is very limited, then I think I think we'll be in a bit of trouble because it won't resemble what's going to happen on a Saturday or a Sunday or whatever the fixture is. Yeah, and in in your opinion, one, and in your experience, what is the best way for transfer to take place, where we can check for understanding and actually see that learning's take taken place? So from Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday of training to fixture day. What, what, in your opinion and your experience, has been the best way for transfer? I think there's, there's little transfer in drills. Uh, I'm not saying there's no learning at all. I'm saying there's, there's little transfer uh, because, again, it doesn't look like the game. Um, I think there's, there's little transfer in unopposed stuff. So I've never seen a soccer game without, without opposition. Um, so... I think there won't be a lot of transfer there. Again, I'm not saying there's no learning. Uh, I don't want to be absolute, but I think that this, this, this said, there could be scenarios uh, such as games, small-sided games. Um, there could be scenarios around exploring with different rules within a game. Uh, people call them condition games. Um, there could be a lot more transfer in what people tend to call uh, non-linear approaches, um, uh, lots of transfer around um, everything to do with um, getting children to develop their own game in terms of what they can notice from the game. Um, so constraints laid approach would be another another term or, or another approach. Um, I think those things will have loads of transfer. Uh, they will take longer. They will take a lot longer in terms of the eyes of the adults to, to see, well, this is what's happening. This is uh, how training should look. Uh, there is learning here because we can go around the cones. We could go around the cones in 10 seconds last week. Now we can go around the cones in eight seconds. Well, yes, I'm going to, I'm going to probably give in and say, yes, it's, it's two seconds less for the world championships of, of dribbling or going around the coast. Dribbling yes. through coast, yeah. Yeah, um, but again, if we look at a game of football, then it, it looks very different. Um, so again, I think I think we need to look at the game, we need to look at our practices, we need to be intentional around our practices, we need to be intentional at things like um, co-coaching with other coaches, we need to be intentional at um, how we are supporting players and how we are stretching players. Um, and again, how we how we creating the best possible experience for everyone there, um, which I know sounds repetitive, but but it should be in the, in in the back of every single coach. So, with the with giving a little bit of repetition, because we know that repetition builds yeah. uh, muscle memory, right? Let's yeah. uh, give us your top three things for the environment for the training environment from the player perspective, top three things, and then top three things from a coaching perspective. And you, you've touched already on some of them, right? Planning, intentional, you know what I mean? Session design. So in terms of, in terms of environment, I will start with, with a loving and caring environment. That would be, that would be my first one. Um, there is a, a lot of 
unpleasantness, if that's a word. Uh, I don't want to use the word hate, but uh, there is a, a, a lot of that at the moment. So I think um, people talk about sports as being a tribe. Um, so if you want to be part of one of the biggest tribes in the world and you go into the tribe, then you feel part of the tribe, which is fantastic. Um, and then somebody makes you feel not very well in, in that tribe, but you probably don't want to be part of it anymore. So I would probably start from there. Uh, um, which again would, goes back to relationships, love and caring, no, relationships, knowing who's in front of you. Yeah. 100%. So, so, so know the person in front of you, get to know them if you think you know them, get to know them even more. Yeah. Uh, and get to care for them and, and make decisions around what's 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 the best um how does how does this look the best and and then let's just make decisions around how, how we get to that um i talk a lot about about intention as well so having having intention so making sure we have an intention about what we're doing uh, with a purpose um and obviously it goes hands in hand with what we were saying before in terms of getting to know people and that people knowing what, what are your intentions or what you're trying to, to take that team of that group of people or whatever that is and, and, and making sure that they're, they're on board. Um, so we said we, we talked about love, we talked about intention um, uh, and yeah I think I think I'll, I'll leave it in those top top two I mean there, there could be there could be quite a few more um, around yeah. that. Uh, if we take that to the coaching, um, I, I would probably start with making it look like the game. So making sure it looks like what's going to happen on Saturday. Um, I would always talk about the principles of the game, whatever whatever the sport is. So having your principles of the game, what content do we need to make those principles of the game um, look, I mean, for practice to look like the actual game. And then... Uh, how would, I'm, I'm thinking about how would I would plan a session to, to make it to make it the best possible session. I would have a column around the principle of the game, a column around the content, a column around feedback and how, how am I going to do feedback. And I'll probably have a column around co coaching and what's who's doing what and when and stuff like that. But not just looking at um, attack and defense or just looking at midfielders and goalkeeper. Or, or looking at uh, what happens in the transition, I would be I would be really interesting about the intentionality of those coaches that are coaching. Um, who's going to stretch people? Who's going to who's going to pause the game? Who's going to have some one on ones? Who's going to have some uh, discussions with the, with their feedback groups? Because we've established feedback groups at the beginning of the season, um, and for that coach, he knows that five children really well, um, and they all got their individual development plan. Uh, even if it's not a, a thirty-five pages long uh, plan, it's, it's in both of their heads. So the child and the coach, um, and that child is being constantly stretched, constantly challenged. Um, what touching base around learning all the time and how people want to learn. Um, I'll I, I've stolen something from Richard Cheatham, uh, MB. I don't want to forget the the MB. Um, uh, Chich talks about how people want to learn. Um, so I watch him speak a few times, and I, I, I've I've been sitting down in some of his lectures at Winchester University, and and he would always ask people, "How do you want to learn today?" And guess what? Nobody ever answers. Nobody ever goes, oh, I want to learn this yeah. way. Um, so I think having children in those environments, being able to tell you how they want to learn, how often you want you to post the game, how rare is for a child to say, I want to get together in a group of 25 people and talk to all of them now, which is what adults look like. Okay. Um, so so being, being able to have children challenging your thinking, um, in the right way of challenging, not just challenge for, for the sake of challenge here, yeah? um, with the objective of trying to get better for everybody there to try to get better. Um, I think that's 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 really cool, that's really important. Um, and when you get to something like that, as I think it tells you a lot about the coaches, about the environment they're trying to create. Uh, it's got to be a loving and caring and intentional environment without the word, without a doubt. Um, because if it wasn't like that, they wouldn't have got to the point where um, 
someone said on Sunday in Croatia, um, I thought we were only going to play for three minutes regardless. So coach yeah. shouted out, oh, let's, let's do one more. So this, this kid stopped the game uh, and went, I thought we were going to play for three minutes regardless. Well, I think that's really intentional. Uh, and I think that's putting a coach in a vulnerable situation where the coach is learning, the kids are learning, and the kids understood that they weren't going to be able to do that on Sunday. They wouldn't be able to go to the referee and say, oh, can we have one more because they just score and we want to score. So so getting to those points, I think it's going to be a loving, intentional environment where, where feedback, learning, um, everything to do with how people want to want to do those things uh, are there and, and people are able to, to challenge it and sort of bring it up. Yeah, I think I think you hit on a, quite a few there. Um, it, it's interesting, right? We, the feedback and the learning, and uh, I think it was Rusty that might have said, feedback is what the players give us, not what we give them. You know what I, I mean? Understand. And uh, cheats, yeah, cheats, cheats is, has been brilliant with us as well. We have a, an ongoing WhatsApp conversation and and Facebook and he's really looking at that learning. What they're looking at now in schools, uh, one in some schools where my wife works, for example, they, they have a whiteboard and they put on the board, what do you know? What do you want to know? What did you learn, right? So that's the what they're doing on the, on the whiteboards and the use of whiteboards and stuff like that. I would use um, whiteboards a lot in my sessions. Um, so, so for the coaches watching and listening to this, um, I will always have a, a whiteboard with me. Um, there will be lots of kids that would like to see things written down um, and add things and a, a good way of involving people that perhaps have not been able to be part of the session uh, in terms of running around, but they can be part of the session in many other ways uh, instead of just going home or, or playing on the playing on their phones or texting or whatever. Um, so I will always have whiteboards around uh, and, and I think it's a great resource. Um, I like that. I like those three questions. That's that's cool. I'm going yeah. to use that. Yeah, I, I like uh, you know the fact that you have a whiteboard, and if you do have somebody injured, you have an opportunity for them to scribe or picture, and you know what are they noticing? What are you noticing? And that way, uh, we're giving ownership to the to the children, right? As yeah. opposed to always the coaches. And when we step in, I think a lot of coaching done is around fixing stuff, as opposed to stuff. Did you guys see the run that uh, Brody just made? That was brilliant. That's exactly what we want. Brody, yeah. tell us about, you, you know what I mean? I think a lot of that coaching. I think just on top of that is to go on, you know, what you're saying about loving and caring. I think it's the old Maya Angelou quote, right? Um, people, you, you know, they, they, they don't know. They, they, they'll remember how you, you made them feel, but they'll, they'll know how you care. And I've got the quote jumbled, but, you, you know where I'm going with that, right? So just yeah. that relationship piece. So the quicker you get your pocket guide out, one, and finish that PhD, the better it is. So, you know, done, people done. can use that. Pardon? I'll get it done. Yeah, yeah. You have to, right? Part of your PhD. Uh, you've got a hello. It's not a question. And we will start taking questions. We've got a hello, hello one from Jose. From Jose, uh, let me tell you the rest. We've got some international guests on from Jose Alonso Savedera. Okay. So I don't know if you know Jose, but he's saying hello. Um, is it Jose or is it Juan? In Spanish now. Let's just say hello to Jose. <laughs> Jose, Jose, sorry. He said it was right. I, I got his name right. I didn't butcher the pronunciation, but he sends you big, uh, big well, love. Man. So um, well, thanks for joining us, by the way. Jose. Um, so just while we're in the space, right, obviously, how long have you been doing this one, what you've been doing, like with Sud America uh, coaching? Obviously, we met uh, the last year. Been for, uh, just over two years now, I think. Yeah, yeah. just two years. But you've been in this coaching space for a long time, working with the schools and coach development and teaching. Um, what, what is it, right, over the last two years, that you've got really excited about? What is it that excited you in the last couple of years? And we may have already touched upon it, but yeah, what, I think, what, what I think things what, are you not? Well, I was coming out of a, of a prem club and I thought to saw it come in and, and, and then um, I basically had to go and do something. It was either try to get another job or I had, my, I had this thing going. 
Um, it's been going for some time. Um, and it was one of those things I still remember. I was at a rugby club in Argentina. Um, we, ju we just finished like a workshop, I think. It looked like a workshop. Um, someone said, oh, how, how much do we own you kind of thing? And I was like, well, uh, I don't know. We're just going to have a barbecue and we'll, we'll, we'll be okay. Uh, but then I sort of realized I could turn it into a business. And um, it was one of them that, uh, so, so I, wa I want to coach as many people as I can. Yeah, so at, at the time when it all started, I wanted to go and coach uh, and have as, as much interventions, which as much people as possible. Uh, but halfway through the process, I sort of realized, well, if I don't tell, or if we don't uh, try to influence the, the people that are in charge of, of the environments, uh, then it's going to be really hard because uh, players can have a lot of information, but if they're not allowed, let's say, to go and go and play the way they want to play, go and practice the way they want to practice, then um, because they're being restricted by some beliefs and some um, sort of resilient knowledge uh, uh, that is out there, uh, then obviously they won't be able to move forward as, as coaches so i sort of made this switch and went on to went on to the people that were responsible for that so uh, coaches uh, teachers uh, professors in universities some decision makers at, at different organizations so um, a common theme in in the last year or so has been i've been working with some organizations the coaches are really enjoying um, this way of going about coaching you can see the players are, are starting to understand why people want them to learn in that way. Um, and they're becoming better players in, in the process of it because they're making those decisions. And at the same time, they've got more resources, such as questioning, challenging, and all these things that we mentioned before. Uh, but then the thing that's starting to reoccur is, can you come and work with our decision makers? Can you come and work with, with, with the admin side of the club? Um, and I, I'm, I'm really intrigued about, about why. Well, the thing is, all these coaches were making these adjustments to the, the philosophies and they were trying to develop that. And, and sort of this bug of, oh, I need to know a little bit about a constraints led approach, or I need to go and do a bit more about exploration and discovery and these things. Um, so they are going around the internet, they are consulting other coaches, they are reading some books and things like that. And then when they're having a conversation with somebody that makes decision in the club, the decision maker doesn't have the information they have. So it's a bit of a clash in there. Yes. And so that's been that's been a that's been a theme uh, that's really interesting to me now. Uh, I wasn't going to include a chapter in the in the practical guide about them. Uh, but I think at the end of the day is that if they are making decisions around the way people are going to coach and who's getting hired, who's getting fired and um, sort of coaching philosophies and all these things. Uh, well, they need the information. Um, so I'm, I'm flying to I'm flying to Argentina and Chile next week. Um, and uh, half of the clubs that I'll be seeing, uh, we got an instance with the with the uh, yeah, admin sort of decision makers, uh, uh, chairmen, and, and, and people like that. Um, so I think that's been really interesting because um, I, I like to think it as a model of sort of 360 leadership approach within the organization. Um, so the coaches that are down here are telling the decision makers that are up here sort of the way they want to go about their coaching. Um, and obviously, if you have a look at the, at the full picture, then the players are hopefully telling coaches how they want to be coached, how they want to be learning, how they want to become better players and how they want to spend their time in practice, how they want the pre-match to look, how they want half time to look and so on and so forth. So um, I think that's a nice sort of missing link uh, in the process that, I, that I'm excited about. I'm, I'm excited to spend some time with, uh, with people that for some reason I'm thinking they're going to be waiting for me with their arms closed. Uh, or their arms crossed, just just waiting for me like that and see what this guy's going to say on a Friday afternoon. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's it goes down to a lack of information um, in, in terms of what what people have access to and, and how they're making their decisions. Um, 
so chairs and committee groups and, and all these people, they cannot be experts at everything they do. Uh, I've got no, no doubt whatsoever they got the best intention for every single organization they work for, otherwise they wouldn't be there. 95% of them or 99% of them as volunteers. Um, so the bottom line is they want to be there, they got the best intentions. Now, do they need a bit more information? Do they need a bit more support? They probably do. Yeah, yeah, huge. Now, do you ever get everybody in the same room one? Do you, do you meet with subsects? Do you go with coaches, then you go with the admin, then you go with the, with stakeholders or CEOs, whatever? Or do you ever get them in the, all in the same room discussing things? Or have you found that separating it's them hard. then bringing them together is better? It's hard, it's hard. I mean, 90% of the organizations I work for are, are amateurs, are, are non-profitable. Um, some of them are charities even. Um, mm -hmm. And it's hard to get all these people in the same room. Um, there are different ways to, to get people at different times in, in two or three days and am I working with them. Um, and at least try to get them to sing from the same hymn sheet. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's sort of trying to relay some information uh, around how environments could look, how people learn, um, and, and where is the world of education trying to go towards. Mm -hmm. uh, so that would be that, those would be the key messages. Um, how we coach uh, in a kickoff or in a line out or in a, a goalkeeping scenario, things like that. Uh, they they are not even top ten of the of the priority list. I would have thought. So the X's and O's are not the top ten thing. Yeah. So we've got a first question and it comes from, from uh, Deborah. And Deborah's a retired PE teacher and she's asking, how important is the knowledge and education of child development in, in the success of children? I love the last bit there, Chris, can you say that again? In, in the, I... Yeah, in the success, in, the, in the, the success of children developing. So basically knowing who's in front of you, which we've discussed. Yep. Right. So how important is that knowledge of child education, how a child learns and child development? Um, I, I, look, I think, thanks for the question, Deborah. Good, good to have you on board. Um, good that you're still here after whatever it is, 40 minutes now. Um, yeah, I think, look, it's, it, it's definitely important. Um, you, let's put it this way, this, it wouldn't happen in any other sector. Uh, the lack of information. So if you work in architecture, if you're a plumber, or if you're a builder, or if you're a lawyer, then you will have quite, quite a bit of information in terms of what you do. Now, all, all those four uh, ladies and gents uh, might be coaching the local club with limited access to, to information in terms of how people learn. Um, now, I think it's a responsibility, uh, again, from the decision makers of the club, uh, or the organization to, to go and provide that information, especially if it's got to do with things like safeguarding, uh, especially if it's got to do with things like uh, long-term impact of, of what people are, are trying to do, um, anything to do with uh, getting that, that those children to uh, anything to do with, with those volunteers to get to know their children better, I think it should be it should be a responsible uh, it should be a responsibility of of the organisations to lay out. For example, um, sharing curriculum would be helpful. There you go. Coaches meetings, getting people in, sharing your and philosophy, hearing their philosophy, um, and, expectations, and, 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 defining expectations and standards. Oh yeah, hundred percent. So, sorry to interrupt. Carry on. No, no, no. Carry on. I think I think I think the majority of that people, if they're sane people, they they will come to those things. They they will want those resources. Um, nobody will be coming down on on a chairman's sort of door knocking down for information about how children learn. Uh, that's that's the reality of how of how things work. And now, if you're a mom or a dad, you're spending some time with with your daughter on a Saturday morning. Um, then obviously you've got quite a few things going on in your life um, and, and yeah, fair enough, uh, it, it won't be at, at the top of your priorities. Now I think the organisation needs to make it a priority. That would be, that would be my, my advice. I'm not quite sure if I'm, if I'm 
answered your question, Deborah. But I think it's, it's crucial. I think it should come from the organisation, um, and we need to make it relevant. We need to make it again intentional. And um, perhaps if you've got your volunteers times, I don't know, four times uh, in the month uh, on a Saturday morning, uh, perhaps you use 50 minutes of a Saturday morning to to discuss a few things. Um, perhaps you got some sort of protocols within the organization that um, there are a number of things you got to tick before you go and coach before you get on the pitch yeah. and I know it's gonna it's gonna make volunteers life a little bit harder and I know some people are going to be drawn away from the process uh, or because I've got to spend time doing this and I've got to go into a child uh, safeguarding course and I've got to spend four hours on a on a on a first aid course or, yeah. or whatever so, so but again i think i think the organization needs to be intentional around how they go about it yeah and i think you know you hit many of the things that you know have been implemented and have been implemented for years right past the safeguarding you've got to go through the uh, child abuse prevention how do you spot the abuse you know concussion protocols got to attend the meeting to get the gear to get your roster to then you know so yeah absolutely I, obviously going yeah. back to Deborah I think Deborah you, you're a retired PE teacher you've been around for a few years uh, she's I only think you've 22 seen changes, hopefully uh, and she's those retired changes. at the age of 22 one she oh, retired at the age of 22 <laughs> <laughs> yeah but no she's been around the block she's, she's seen it she's seen you know how children learn and the, the changes in teaching and you know the methodology and stuff like that um so one, we're coming to close to our time together. Um, let's talk a little bit now. We've touched upon it through uh, a lot of the stuff we've mentioned. But let's, let's have a little bit of a deeper dive on player-centered approaches and yeah. the advice that you could give our audience to perhaps unlock a few of those myths about player-centered approach and how we can better deliver a player-centered approach. You comfortable with that? Yeah, happy. Give, give me a myth. Give me a myth to start with. Come on. Well, the, the myth is the coach comes and then he puts the session together and it's a lot of rote learning that isn't connected to what the players need, but the coach feels better because he's just seen on Saturday, well, we didn't do this. We didn't do this. So, for example, we're not rebounding. We're not rebounding very well. We'll take basketball for the example. Media coaching. Yeah. I call it media coaching. Um, yeah. I think I think the best planners in terms of coaches are the coaches that uh, plan away from their games. So they got they got a big picture, they got an end in mind, like GB hockey will be using nowadays, uh, and they will see beyond the fixture. They will see beyond uh, the position in the league. They will see beyond the knockout stages. Um, always always aiming to to what's what's next kind of thing. So away from results, not being results exactly. driven. So, to translate that into an educational environment so you've got to see past your your examinations at the end of the year and um, so you've got, you've got to let's say that you've got people in front of you that are going to be doctors that are going to be uh, 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 mechanics that are going to be uh, engineers and, and it could be all these things not just the exam that covers fractions and uh, whatever maths content is there. I think they should they should be able to see beyond that. Um, I think I think another myth would be around, oh, there's a ball, go and play. Now it's child centre because they're doing whatever they want. Uh, well, again, I would child argue- Child but adult led. Environment, and I would argue that's intentional. Um, now from the loving and caring point of view, well, you're not quite sure what's going on. You don't know how people are treating each other. You're just sort of part of the part of the memorabilia there, and yeah, it's six o'clock. Yeah, whistle, let's go home, kind of thing. Um, I think I think child-centered environment and player-centered environment is very different to that. It's got lots of intentionality around what you're trying to do, um, and and yeah, there is an element of the coach buying his or her own time, lots of time during the session. But that doesn't mean the coach is absent from the session. And that doesn't mean it's, it's just another sort of cone on the side, another post or whatever it is. And, and, unless, of course, they're doing this, right? Exactly. Unless they're just scrolling. Yeah. But yeah. being present, yeah. being engaged. Yeah, being engaged, being there, challenging yeah. people, stretching people, um, 
having an, a, a very good idea of what feedback is going to look like in the session. Um, I think that's a good element of, of uh, player centre approach. Um, having a very good idea how people like their feedback. Do they like it in the moment? Do they like it at the end? Do they like it from a teammate? Do they like it from the goalkeeper who's 40, years, 40 yards behind them? Do they like it from the referee? Do they do they not, not like it at all for the next two hours or until the next practice? Um, do they like to have a look at their videos and then go and compare that with something on the internet that they've seen or, or, or whatever it is? So lots of, lots of uh, awareness around, around feedback, I think, is a good element around child centre or, or player centre environments. Um, we, we touch base around choice. Uh, yeah. uh, Something that, that I've been using a lot is, is pause. Uh, so being able to pause the practice when, when people feel comfortable with it. Um, I think having a break time in a session uh, could be a very good element. So if you've got a 45 minute practice uh, or if you've got even an hour and a half practice, uh, having two or three breaks. And those, those are not just water breaks. Uh, they're actually breaks for some information to sink in for the learning process to work in a different way, um, for children to go and do perhaps something away from that sport or that particular moment, for people to go and touch base uh, with their parents or to go and touch base with another teammates that have men uh, perhaps practicing in a different practice on the pitch next door, or whatever it is. So I will have a lot of break times, not lots of break times, I will have break times. But yeah. being intentional about that break, right, and how you oh, use I'm, that break. Yeah, yeah. 100%. Um, I, I, I would I would have conversations with uh, with players and children around when they want to have their break times. What do they what do they want to do in those break times? Um, I will give them options around uh, what sort of practice they want to have. Okay, so how do they want practice to look? Um, and again, it could have an element of Saturday of what just happened. Um, it could have an element around, you mentioned at the beginning of this conversation, what was your core value, that it was empathy, is that right? Yeah. Yeah, good, my memory's not very good. Good job, uh, no, I know you so did well. If you took a, sorry? I said you did very well there. There you go. Yeah. Uh, and and if, if, you, if you're looking about empathy, well, it, break time could be used to talk about those things. Um, there could be a scoring system that is uh, made up, uh, created by the players. Uh, so I think that's that's a good tool for coaches yeah. to go and try that. And um, so we've been working on these things, guys. So what do you think we're working on? What's what's your feedback from Saturday? All right, let's let's work around um, some different ways of scoring points, different ways of losing some points. Um, let's work around what those points could unlock potentially um, and what could happen if we go up a level, down a level or, or whatever is the terminology you're using with, with them. Um, and I think then bringing that to the table, to your whiteboard or, or, or to whatever it is, uh, that's quite a powerful tool because they'll be coming up with things that they're noticing around the game. They will be noticing they're getting better at doing certain things. Um, they will be noticing they're getting better at, let's say, getting the ball back if they're doing certain things. Well, how can we reward that on a scoring system? Okay. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, the, the, making it look like it's player centre is not player centre, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, I think you unpicked a lot of stuff there. So, obviously, session design, um, voice and a choice. Uh, you mentioned leveling up, leveling down. You mentioned giving people a pause. So that goes off Amy Price's video game design, which is slightly different to gamification. But really getting into number one, care. And the best yeah. way to show you care is actually care. <laughs> number two is um, being intentional, right? Yeah. Being intentional in everything we do, whether it's session design. Now, a player centered design might be you might show up with you know, three, three training plans and you put down and you might go to this group and go, hey, you know, which session? You know what I mean? Knowing what yeah. their needs are and asking the players what they feel they need to work on and then yeah. kind of 
not, not going by the seat of your pants, but just having an idea, this is where they might go. And that ties into, of course, knowing who, who you, who's in front of you and stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, they could even design the session. They could, they could get together yeah. and go, look, this is, this is how the session is going to yeah. look like, have some input around it. And, yeah. But that's not on the spot. That would have been done, you know, a day before, for example. You know what I mean? Yeah, okay, no, I mean, you guys, that, I mean, your responsibility. Things that I've done before is plan, if I've got an hour session, plan about 40 minutes of it, and then yeah. give them give them 20 minutes uh, and say, look, by the, uh, when we get to minute 40, then we've got to move on to what you guys uh, want to be practicing. Yeah. Um, and it's not a six, seven minutes of sort of fiddling around with cones and balls and uh, coming up. It's, it's 40 minutes whilst the practice is developing in yeah. their heads, trying to plan the last 20 minutes, uh, then, which is quite a hard exercise to, to yeah. go with. Uh, but I think it's a very good noticing exercise as well. So they yeah. will be picking up loads of things that are happening throughout that practice. Then yeah. by the time you get to minute 40, when boom, well, this is what we're reflecting on. Okay, let's translate that into how we're going to make that look better. Yeah, we um we did we did something on Saturday with a group of uh, 2009s, so a 10 year old boys. So we asked them to think about their super strength, two things that got them on the team. But then instead of me saying my super strengths, I had a partner. You were my partner one, and I said, yeah. listen, you know, I think one super strengths were one's ability to communicate and one's ability to show that he cares by actually caring. So. I then chose your two super strengths and then you chose mine. So instead of me talking about my super strengths, I gave it to you through a different lens of a teammate. And uh, the, the boys loved it. You know, it was a, it was something a little bit different. Um, and it's funny how when you ask 10 year old children to do that, some of the answers that you can get, you know, it's amazing when we just give them a little chance and, and, and let them go with it. Absolutely. I remember yeah. doing a, again, big wide, but side of the page. Uh, I've never met a group of girls before. It was a rugby union session. They, there were about 16, 17 girls there. Some of them very new to the game. Some of them quite experienced with two or three years under their belts. And they, I said, okay, go and write down your name um, and write down a sentence next to it that will be your big uh, target for tonight. Um, and it wasn't real. I mean, you couldn't categorize it because there were so many different things. So there were things like uh, related directly with the game. So they were talking about support, which is a principle of the game in rugby union. And they were talking about things like uh, uh, showing more love and affection. That was actually a, a sentence mm -hmm. somebody wrote down. Um, one of the girls wrote down something like uh, keeping calm and not losing the plot. Um, and obviously that was a very experienced player uh, yeah. who was actually in an England pathway um, and, and it won't be many years until we see her playing in the big leagues and uh, again she was playing with girls that have been playing for a couple of months so so she was again developing loads of core values such as your core value of the month which is empathy. Um, oh, good job. You've mentioned, it more, you, you've mentioned it more times than I have now. Well, there you go. There you go. Good. good. I like it wasn't that. a secret mission. It wasn't a secret mission. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, and every time, every time they felt they were uh, achieving that or contributing towards that, or every time somebody noticed that in them, they would run to the to the board and do like a little smiley face next to it. Yeah. Um, and it was all about can we get a hundred smiley faces by the end of the session? Uh, and we got way more, we got, got loads more. Uh, but again, it was it, it was really interesting to to pick those those seventeen sentences apart and trying yeah. to get them in category. It would have been it would have been impossible. Yeah. So we're going to take this and use this as our final question before I let you wrap up one. And it's from Deborah again. Uh, Deborah, thanks for your question again. She says in coaching. She's still there, yeah, yes, yeah, she, she is retired. We did talk about that. Um, in, in, in coaching an under girls, under eight girls recreational team, I noticed as a coach, you can have the best intention and plan for practice. However, many times I have to change things because of the personalities of the girls or the mood they are in. Give them, giving them a voice is very import, important. What is your advice? 
would say keep them involved. So I think, yeah, keeping them involved, so asking them more, right? Hey, is that what you're saying? Yeah, and I was, I was going to just build off that. I think it's great that she's flexible and adapting based on the mood, which shows that she's getting to know them, but also saying, you know, maybe saying we're going to do these two activities. The third activity is for you to choose. So now maybe that keeps their engagement longer and, and stuff like that. And again, I'm just throwing something out there. One, she's asking for your advice because she gets me on a daily basis, either by text, email or phone. Um, so she's looking for a fresh voice as opposed to my dull tone. I I would try a, a few intentional things. So I would try getting there slightly earlier, um, leaving your, your back of footballs out there um, and a few cones and stuff and see what the girls come up with. Uh, so intentionally be like 10, 15 minutes late or, or sort of stay behind chatting with parents and stuff uh, and see what the girls come up. Um, and, and you might you might sort of lay it out the week before and go, look, girls, there's going to be some balls there. Um, I've got to I've got to have some conversations with your parents around X. Um, you're allowed to you, you can have those balls. You can play with those balls. Uh, you're not allowed to go outside this area for, for safety purpose. Um, and you guys can start playing. I think a very good challenge for you as a coach would be going out there and sort of piggybacking on your on their on their game uh, and see what they've come up with. Uh, it'd be really interesting to see. Um, somebody was telling me the other day um, uh, around uh, around canoeing. Yeah, so um, artificial canoeing. It wasn't a natural river. So every time they turn the water tap on, um, I think it's, it was about over a thousand pounds that they were that they had to pay. That that was the bill. Yeah, for an hour it was over a thousand pounds. So being so what they got to do in that practice was costing them a lot of money. Um, so obviously, if the athlete wasn't involved or how the athlete was going to try to get better in that hour, uh, it was going to be a waste of time. It was going to be a massive waste of money. So again, go, going back to Deborah's environment, I think um, it's great. It's great that you're keeping some flexibility around what they're trying to do. It would be unrealistic for you to go through a whole season just saying what this girl's going to do Saturday out, Saturday out. Um, keep it keep it fresh as much as you can. Um, I would try to get to what are the current interests. Um, is it is it certain video game? Is it Fortnite? Is it uh, Call of Duty? Is it um, what's the singing yeah. and dance called? Uh, I think of a name now, but anyway, what well, what is their interest? What sorts of video games are they playing? What sorts of movies are making they making relevance? Yeah, are they, yeah, exactly. Make it relevant. Are they a big fan of Frozen? Which which I think most girls that age would be. Um, are they into or, or or whatever it is? Um, and then perhaps try to create. I don't know if it's if it's some sort of league with, within your training sessions where you have fifteen minutes or a certain game that is related gone. to their interest. Um, I don't know. Uh, look, look for some ways of engaging them, hooking them up early, um, and going well. Uh, today you're not in your best mood, uh, or two or three of your big characters in there, they're not in the best mood. Well, but it's league time, so they're going to get really excited about the league. Um, or, or, or yeah, I mean, yeah. so so f from now on, there's going to be um, in pairs. Uh, you're going to be leading our. Uh, I know the, the, the first 10 minutes of warm up we're going to do, two of you are going to lead it. Um, okay, I'm going to have some sort of road time where people are going to lead it. So, uh, for some girls, it, it will create some anxiety around being exposed in front of the groups. So some girls will be loving it. Um, and again, for both of them, there'll be loads of learning in, in that um, in in that instance of, of coaching and learning and feedback. Um, so, yeah, keep, keep them involved, keep it flexible. Um, There'll be there'll be lots of parents wondering what's going on here. Why are these two girls doing all the talking and you're standing there on the side? Uh, anyway, that's that's a different conversation. Yeah, it is. I think well, Debbie is their own faith. The parents have to do obviously the history as a PE teacher and everything. She does a good job. So, but anyway, one. Uh, I want to be civil of your time. I want to thank you for your time. 
tell us tell us a little bit about what you've got going on, what you're working on. Um, you know, a while back, but we actually met in person in January. We went to the Future of Coaching conference with Richard Cheetah, Neil Sullen, and MBE. Sorry, I forgot the MBE. Um, but tell us, tell us a little bit about what you've going you got going on upon your masters and some of the stuff and how pe people could you or follow your work. Um, follow you on Twitter, uh, for example. I'm going to be. Um, uh, it was quite crackly there, but I think you got it. I, I think I got the question uh, about what's coming my way. Um, I've got a couple of weeks in South America. Um, I was meant to have a couple of weeks um, in Asia, following that. Um, all of those things, or most of those things, uh, are on standby at the moment. Um, I've got uh, a number of uh, mentees that, I, that I'm working with in, in different sports as well, uh, through different programs. Again, in, in different sports, um, some of them in education, so not not just in sports. So obviously, attaching base with them, and and it's all safe to sort of do these type of things. So I think I'm going to be spending a lot of time. Um, staring at, at my face on, on, on cameras and things. Um, I, I've got a conference coming up in here in England, uh, in the north of England, in York, uh, at a school uh, called Bucklington School on the 24th of April. Um, so everybody, obviously, more than more than welcome to, to come on to that. Um, we are going to have uh, Nick Levet. Uh, we're going to have Richard Cheatham. I'm going to have Sarah Green, uh, Cheat. We spoke about him, Winchester University, Doctor Learning, a uh, lot of experience um, talking talking about learning and learning about learning. Uh, Nick is the current uh, head of coaching at uh, UK Coaching, which is the governing body. Um, for everything to do with, with coaching awards in this country. Um, uh, Sarah is the uh, performance uh, coach developer at England Netball. Um, so all three of them um, talking everything to do with uh, how coaching is going to look in the future, hence the future coaching name. So that's 24th of August uh, at Pocklington School in York. Um, April. And then there's a number of... 24th of April. April, yeah, Minnesota sorry, April. April, yeah, that's right, sorry. Good um, yeah, there's a number of projects after that. Hopefully, I'm in America in June, everything going well and, and um, the world not uh, not exploding or us becoming zombies. Um, so hopefully, I'm in June in, in America. I've got another Asia trip in November. Um, I'm meant to be in Italy again early June. Uh, you're making me look at my calendar now. Uh, back to South America in August. Uh, so lots of things going on there. There is a, a big project on on the work pipes at the moment. Um, which to our Armstrong from the Talent Equation, um, and it's going to be it's going to be quite different uh, and it's i think it's going to be very interesting um i'm not i'm not going to pick it up anymore but th there should be some stuff coming out uh, at the end of this month uh, so obviously you'll be you'll be one of the first to to, to know about that and uh, so you can spray around your network and stuff so yeah, absolutely yeah so lots of things absolutely. lots of things so, uh, coming my way I did, we, 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 you got obviously your busy slam calendar things some things on hold some things accelerating but uh jose alonso Savadera, he just said i really want to go and take a course with one how can i know dates prices and places so tell you, tell um, you to re reach out to me um jose my uh, my twitter handle is at suit coaching so sud coaching um, it's the same username around Facebook and Instagram. Um, and my, uh, if you want to add me on WhatsApp, is plus uh, four four, um, which is um, Britain, England, um, and then it's zero seven five four five double zero four seven two one. Um, so send me a message in in, in any of them. Uh, I'm, I'll, I'll let you know some some details around those bits. And perhaps we can meet when I'm in Colorado in June. Yeah, uh, I don't know where Jose is based, but I'm just trying to put the your number in the notes. But it made me call you instead. Don't worry, mate. <laughs> but, don't uh, worry, mate. Get we'll your money. Yes. Yeah, so. 
Yeah, Jose, hopefully you've got that, that stuff too. So he's in St. Louis, Missouri, and uh, he says he looks forward to catching up. Uh, nice hopefully one. in, nice in Colorado when you're here. Yeah, yeah and uh, Jose, you should have my contact info and I can get you connected with one as well. Brilliant. So, uh, Juan, uh, an hour has flown by. We're 65 minutes in, 66, as, as they usually do. I can't thank you enough for coming on. I hope uh, Lula and Kata are well. Please send my regards. And uh, my hope yeah. is that, you know, we connect again soon. And I look forward to hearing at the end of this month, which is your birthday, I believe, and my birthday, the same day. Correct. Um, so I look forward to hearing what's coming down the pike and how I can get involved with you and Stuart and, and the rest of the group and um, move this needle a little, little more on what coaching should look like, what learning looks like and how we can make it better. So, Absolutely, mate. Absolute pressure as always. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me again. Yeah. Thanks, Juan. Thanks, everybody. Um, our next call is pretty soon uh, with, with um, Alex Twitchin. Uh, who's a coach developer. So Juan, I know you'll put that out to your network and you're welcome to join us. And you always ask very thought provoking questions. Come and join us, join us with Twitch, um, who developed that online coach developers course as well as part of the Open University. But uh, this is Juan Gonzalez Mendia from uh, Sud America Coaching. Follow him if you don't, you should. And uh, let's keep going. Keep making a difference, everybody. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye.